All right. Um, if you guys all went to the previous talk, this just like starts from there. All the stuff he says you shouldn't do, that's what I'm going to start talking about. So. And, and, and I agree with him. You, sh you sh basically shouldn't do this. You should leave and go to the other talk. Um, so this is, uh, last, last year I did an introduction to lock-free programming, so this is the next year I'm going to try to continue. And uh, first what I want to do is kind of summarize which was, I had like two hours of stuff last year and tried to fit it into 90 minutes and didn't, didn't fit it in. So I'm now going to take that two hours and condense it to 30 minutes <laughs> or even less. And let's see if I can do that. So summary from last year, use locks. That, that was a joke for anyone who came last year. Because that's all I talked about was don't do this, use locks. But that, that was my, my uh, gauge to see how many people were here last we're year. Dust off the... <laughs> Remember? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, the basic idea being that don't try this stuff at home. So, um, a guide to threaded coding, just from me. Forget what you learned in kindergarten. You probably didn't learn threaded coding in kindergarten, <laughs> but what you learned was, you know, share, share nicely. So, stop sharing. That's, that's my first uh, thing about, when you, as soon as you start to talk about threading, the problem is that you're trying to share a bunch of variables, and that's where you start getting into trouble. Um, of course, like we were just talking about earlier, you. If your thread never shares anything, then you'll never know that it did any work. So you, you have to share, but you should try to minimize it. And then the second thing you should be doing is using locks because you want to protect that stuff you're sharing. And then you should probably measure your performance. And then you should measure your performance again and measure you know, your contention and stuff like that. And then you know, if the performance isn't good, go back, change your algorithm, which probably means go up to one, stop sharing so much stuff, and repeat this process, and you'll notice that this is an infinite loop. Uh, I guess in theory, you, you leave when, when your measurement is good enough, or if you get stuck in the infinite loop, you might have to go to lock free. So <laughs> the point of this is lock free coding is the last thing you want to do, right? You, way down here, way, way down here. <coughs> Try everything else first. So, uh, this is an example, which is uh, one of two quick examples that I want to do to kind of set the foundation here. Um, so, you know, normal code, uh, that is actually not good code. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of normal code is not good code. Um, we want to do something exclusive, so we try to set a lock. And if no one else has locked it, we will, you know, it'll be our lock and then we'll do our exclusive stuff. And of course, in a threading environment, this is bad, and I hope you guys know why it's bad. It's because right here between you checking the lock and you setting the lock, some other thread could have came in and done the same thing. So, you know, thread one comes in and says, hey, no one's got this lock. Thread two comes in and says, hey, no one's got this lock. And thread one then says, hey, I'm going to take this lock. And thread two says, yeah, me too, I'm going to take this lock. Hey, I'm going to do exclusive stuff. Hey, me too, I'm going to do exclusive stuff. Oh, well, wait, what was exclusive supposed to mean again? So there's a problem there, and whenever you're doing, and this kind of goes back to Hans' whole thing about sequential, you know, reordering and interleaving of your lines of code. In threading, you often have to read between the lines and think of what else can happen between these lines of code. <coughs> and that's why in his talk, if you use locks properly, you don't have to worry about every single line of code and what happens in between it, but we're trying to not use locks. So the problem is, of course, that we need to do these two steps at once, need to do it atomically so nothing can get in between them. And how do we do that? Well, did I, did I actually skip a... Nope, that's the next thing. Okay, we have this great thing called CAS, and uh, it's uh, well, uh, too many things at once here. So first we use this thing called atomic, and we make our Boolean uh, an atomic Boolean, and then we do this crazy thing called compare exchange. So you'll notice that we were checking a lock and then we we're trying to set the lock and compare exchange does that for us. It says, if it was false, then make it true for me and let me know whether that succeeded or not. And if it succeeded, that means it was false. I set it to true. I get in, I can do exclusive stuff and no one can get in, in between, right? We've, we've closed that gap that existed here and we've made it atomic. So in the standard, this is called compare exchange. I have a tendency to call it CAS, which stands for compare and set, or compare and swap, or test and set, or compare exchange. There's all these different names for it. Um, but if you hear me saying CAS all the time, I should be saying compare exchange. And basically, there's the bad code. This great new thing called atomic 
and compare exchange, we fix that problem and we're good to go, right? So that's a, that's a whole example about making things atomic. Hello. Oh, so yeah, that's simple, right? Um, it's not completely simple because once upon a time, if statements used to, used to check something like x equals 5 and it would last for the, 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 the whole if block, x wouldn't change on you. So in lock-free programming, you do have to remember to read between the lines, but besides that, that's fairly simple. And now we have, this is almost exactly Hans's, uh, one of his last examples. We want to set some data, let somebody know that data is ready, and then some other thread will check that the data is ready and then use it. So that looks completely normal, except for it's broken. And we'll see why it's broken is because here's your code from thread one that sets the data. And here's what the evil CPU does to you, and it decides to reorder that data, or the, the memory uh, assignments. And why does it do this? Basically, once upon a time, the CPU and the RAM ran at the same speed, many, many, many moons ago. And now the CPU runs at 100 times as fast as RAM. So the CPU doesn't want to wait around for all these memory accesses and memory stores and loads. It just wants to keep going. And the basic rule is, for both the CPU and the compiler is do any optimizations as you like as long as it just doesn't change how the program works, of course. There's this tiny little, you know, it's always the fine print that says, in this case, it's assuming a single-threaded program. The compiler and the CPU can reorder all your code as long as it's, it, it's imagining that there's only ever one thread running. Dave. Um, so I, I find thinking about things reordering my code to be to just make the whole problem more complicated. Yes. Um, it's another way of saying what you're saying, but but if you look at the original code, there wasn't any guarantee about what order those things was going to happen in in the first place. True, but the the oh there is no guarantee yeah, yeah. that those things will happen in any given order. Yeah. So the question because being, you don't do anything to look at, you don't do anything to observe the order. So there's nothing there that. That makes well, it, even in the single-threaded case, do those in any given sequence. The, the, I think the idea is that the naive programmer looks at this and thinks this makes sense, right? That you imagine that all your code runs in order. That's just the way we think of things. And on a normal thread, you're you're fine to think of things running in order because you can't you can't see the the you can't open up your computer, crack it open, look at the, the CPU and the memory and go, oh, look at the order things are really happening in. So yeah, like what Dave's saying is from any one thread, all you can per perceive is what that thread perceives. And you know, what order would that happen in? You can't tell unless you try to ask that thread to look at it. But so th yeah, uh, the, and for that naive person though, this makes sense that, okay, well this other thread is gonna try to see what happened over on the first thread and it's gonna try to read and figuring that this happened in this order, that it could do that. And you can't do that because of the CPU and that. So things get reordered. And what we'd like to say is, I, I hope that wasn't intentionally too small to read, it says shift happens because your memory things get shifted around on you. Purposely too small to read. Um, and so for the other half of your code, it's like, well, you know, how could this get reordered? Because you can't do this unless you've already read this data, right? Yet the CPU will gladly do that for you by reading the data into a temporary possibly, then checking if it's ready, and then using the temporary. And basically, this is because the CPU wants to look ahead and, uh, you know, and do things like speculative execution. Like, oh, I'm going to start reading these things ahead of time in case I need them later and stuff like that. So given those problems, we, have, we now realize that our original code isn't very perfect. And how do we fix this? Well, first of all, we use an atomic again, make, make that Boolean an atomic. And then next thing we do is nothing. This is basically Hans's argument that, you know, using atomic bool with sequential consistency, this magically now works. These things did happen in the order you expected them to happen in. And if you see this to be true, then you know that that, was ha ha that happened and this happened and everything happened in the order you, you wanted. Um, now, if we're trying to do lock-free programming, it's probably because we want things to be really, really fast. And there's a subtlety here of, you know, what happens with this atomic is the compiler and the CPU have done extra work to make sure that these things happen in order 
and that tends to slow things down because the memory is slower. And also now, let's imagine you had some more code after this, and in this case you have some more code before this. Well, this also doesn't get reordered with your data ready. So this, ha this definitely will happen after because we've got sequential consistency. And you know what? We don't care if this happened before or after. It has nothing to do with our data. So what we'd really like is to allow the CPU to reorder this because it's not important. And same thing down here, we've got a read of R and a write of W. Maybe this could happen after the if, or maybe it could happen essentially at the same time as the if, if you've got uh, parallel streams in your, in your CPU. And what we're doing with using the atomic is saying, no, no, everything has to be sequential around the data ready. Everything before data ready has to be before and everything after has to be after. So we'd like to loosen that a little bit and getting rid of the Q, the Q and W things there, just and back to our original thing. So what we're going to do is say memory order release, which says <coughs> all I really care about is the data and what happened before here. And the way I like to think of memory order release is before means before. Anything that I wrote before here actually has to be visible to everybody else as happening before this happens. I don't care what happens after. If stuff happens down here, that queue that was there, it can happen up here. I don't care. I only care about the stuff that I wrote before the setting the data ready, which is exactly what the programmer is trying to do here, right? You, uh, a couple of times you said everything that's before or everything that's after is happening. And what I, ha what I don't understand is what the scope of everything is. Are we talking about a block with, with the brackets or are we talking about braces or what are we talking about? Here? We're talking about everything that's happened in your program up to this point. All memory. So, so all of the code previously in all functions and everything up to that, po that point that, yes. that we injected an atomic, not in this slide, slide but previously. Yeah. I mean it's still an atomic but it's, it's well, slightly different the, atomic. So yep. the sequential consistency applies to everything yeah. You know, it, so in either case, whether this is totally sequential assistant or, or not, um, we still don't care about the order that X and Y happened in. X gets set first or Y gets set first. No one cares. All we care is that this happens last. So yeah, this, this is not scope to just data. It's, it's anything that happened up to this point has to have happened. And basically what's going on, and, and I went into detail last time, is that as these things are happening, the CPU is putting them into a write request queue, and it's telling the memory to, hey, could you write this out for me sometime later? And, you know, whenever you get around to it, I'm not going to wait for you. And then the write request queue might decide to reorder X and Y, because maybe this is on, I think it was Macintosh, that Y, in, in a point structure, Y came first and X was the second variable inside the struct, which, you know, you shouldn't care, but kind of odd. Um, so maybe Y is first in memory, so this actually gets set first, and then X gets set first, and that happens in the right request queue. It decides to reorder things on you, but you know that request queue is always being emptied as we go along. So you know how much stuff hasn't been already really written out to memory? Probably not a lot. And at this point, it's just going to make sure that everything else in the queue stays stays ahead of this of this line. This example is also sometimes called publication save. Yes. Because you are <coughs> trying to publish X and Y, and then you are setting a flag and say, I Ex have published Exactly, it. yeah. So whatever happens afterwards really doesn't... Yeah, we don't care about after. We, want, yeah. we care about before. I, I think I probably may have... If not a slide, I know I'm going to use the word publication somewhere in this talk. So... Some, some yeah. of the things you're describing here are actually an implementation artifact. So if you have this eventually consistent store, the, you don't actually need to order that with respect to ordinary data operations that follow it because it's not observable, but the implementation probably will. True. You need to repeat the tape. Uh, um, if I can get that right. Uh, so in the sequential consistent case, in particular when I had a queue down here or whatever, you know, I'm saying that this queue has to happen after because it's sequential consistent. <coughs> A smart CPU and a smart compiler can can relax that by figuring out that no, it doesn't really make any difference. But in a lot of implementations, that's what's going to happen. It's just going to put a strong fence on this to make sure nothing that happens after really, really make sure it does happen after. So anyhow, I think of this as meaning everything that happened before happened before, and sometimes wonder if it should be called that, but it's not. That's okay. It, that makes sense later why it's called release. And then we remember what happens to this code. It gets reordered even though it's across an if statement by things like branch prediction and speculative execution. So we want to do the same thing. In this case, it's the opposite. We want to say 
uh, we need after means after. Everything that happens after this better happen after this. We can't start preloading this before we check, right? We want to make sure the data is there. And now we've got everything happens before, everything happens after. And I always put this up to remind me to say something about this. The interesting part to me about all this is that CPU1 that might be running this thread, all it had to do was make sure it ordered things correctly up to this point. It's just putting things in memory at the right order. It doesn't have to go and talk to CPU2 in any direct way and say, oh, I've written data ready and hey, let, hey over there, data ready and all this stuff. It just writes out in the correct order. And CPU2 behaves on its own. It just makes sure it reads things in the right order. And that makes things a lot faster than if you had to have more communication and contention with you, in between your CPUs. And that's, that's also true in the sequentially consistent case. Um, it's just basically a point about how the way a proper memory model makes CPUs still act independently. And that's the way common memory models are. And also, it doesn't mean that you have to flush the cache. Yeah, you're not really flushing the cache. You're putting a marker in the cache saying, right. you know, make sure it comes in order. Dave? OK, that was the question I was going to ask. So. Yeah. You know, in general, for all this stuff, you often think about, oh, it's a cache coherency problem or something. It's all because stuff is stuck in the cache and not in memory. And really, you can have these problems without a cache at all. It's more of what order did they get written out in, even if there's no cache there. They, but most, most CPUs have cache coherency anyhow, and, and you, you can still have these problems. So the point of the guy's original code was that he wanted A to definitely happen before B. And even when they're on separate CPUs with all this magic, we get that to happen. And so there's his original code. That's what he was hoping for. And magically with Atomic, whether you do it this way with sequential consistency or you do it this way, which is slightly more, and I'm cramming the, you know, shortening my things here. This is maybe is more efficient, but they both give this A happens before B happens. Dave. I've been wondering for some time whether, whether CPU implementations of cache coherency were wasted effort on the yeah, and, and because we, it doesn't give you any real guarantees that you can use most of the time. Yeah, so with, yeah, whether cache coherency is a wasted effort on CPUs, I don't know either because it's that's getting way too far for me. Um, but, you know, you see CPUs like the Alpha, which is maybe not around much anymore, but it, it's cache coherency was so loose that it's like, really, you're calling that cache coherency? You know, and, but that's where you get the cases where, you know, we barely mentioned, um, the consume, memory order consume, that's like, that's like where this is, I'm going to check if the pointer's null and then read the pointer. And, and that gets reordered by alphas. And you're just like, uh, you know, it, it gets so loose that things start to get hard to reason with. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe they'll just, once we have a memory model, maybe the CPUs can turn around and change the way they do cache coherency and loosen it up some more. So this, you know, we we're talking about reordering memory and all this kind of stuff, but I said this is a good C++ OX example. Um, and I know we all have the standard beside our bed at night, and we read it before we go to sleep, and we've read all the drafts and everything. And we probably never see anything about CPUs and memory ordering and the way our instructions get compiled and all that stuff when you read the standard. It doesn't talk like that, right? The standard talks about an abstract machine. And so what does all this mean in standard ease? Basically, the standard says, happens before, because that's what we were trying to do, is make A happen before B. And it's got this magic, happens before is this, this, and the other thing, and let's just break this down a little bit. Simple one, A happens before B if they're on the same thread and they're in program order. So X happens before Y, because you wrote them that way, and so if those are A and B, and if you think of these as A and B, uh, Y happens before data ready. And now, we might know that the CPU might not actually do these in order, but to the standard, it doesn't matter. You can't tell they're not done in order. And in the abstract machine, we decide that this does happen before that, and that happens before that. So that's simple enough. And then this is just a transitive property that if, you know, if this line happens before that line, and that line happens before that line, then A happens before the bottom line. So those are A, B, and C in this case, transitivity. The funky one is synchronizes with. So if happens before is not big enough yet, this is only half the definition of happens before. This is the, you know, more than the other half of happens before. And what does this mean? So we uh, have some code here with 
uh, we're doing the store with a memory order release, and that kind of matches up with this line. It says, if we have a store to an atomic, data ready is an atomic, and it has either memory order release or sequentially consistent, which would be the default, then this line matches that. That looks like a nice line A. So we've got part of our synchronization. We'll squish that over so I can make some room. The other thread was doing a load acquire on the same data ready. So we have this load, memory order acquire, or sequentially consistent. Oh, that looks like a good candidate for B. And, oh, this is probably, in, and you can read Bartosz's blog. He's got a good blog on this particular problem. Note that data ready and data ready are the same variable. So we're doing a release on data ready and a store on data ready. If these aren't the same variable, that's the same with the Decker's example. You can't do store and release on two different variables. You won't get synchronization. You need this to be the same variable. And now the last piece we need for this is the if part that says, hey, I want to see if, do I see the one that got stored here? Will it show up over here? And if the if lines up, we do see a one over here. That means these are synchronized. We've now synchronized our stuff. And for all this code here, or this legalese here, that just means that this A is synchronized with this B, and therefore this happens before that. And then we can now put the whole thing together and say this happens before that because of all these little pieces. We've probably, we need every single line of this to say that X happened before you know, that X there. And that's good because that's kind of what the programmer was trying to do in the first place, right? So those are our two uh, examples. One was make sure you can get rid of this gap and use atomics to do that and make sure you don't get strange reorderings. Make sure things happen in the order you expect it to happen. And we use atomics for both of those things. Um, and basically, these are the two tools we have to work with for lock-free programming. And this is basically all you have to work with. Um, and just to you know, close some little loopholes here, I just want to mention that we can, just looking at the first half of the example, it was talking about making things happen atomically. You know, if you're doing something exclusive, you're probably doing it on some, da some data. So you probably want some kind of memory ordering. And compare exchange does, it doesn't just exchange in any particular way. It has these options for doing what kind of memory ordering you want on it. So basically what I'm saying is you can combine the ato atomicity and the memory ordering into instructions like compare exchange. So we, and then, you know, you probably want to set it back to false and then you've got some sensible code there and you're now doing things exclusively like you hoped. And that's those two examples basically put together. You've got the ordering correctly and this works if it's atomic. You've got no reordering. You don't have to worry about reading between the lines. Everything works. Yes? In this compare exchange, you use this memory order acquired, does it, but compare exchange can perform both read and, and, and write. Right? right. So does it mean that it also uses memory order release to... to uh, this to compare exchange actually has more parameters than I'm showing. It's got like five. And you could decide you can really tweak what memory ordering you want on the read and the and the set, but basically the the read and the set happen at the same time. So you get if if I say acquire, I'm getting some of the other stuff for free. Um, the, usually, what you'll you'll just do is sequentially consistent. But in this case, I know all I need to all I need to do is is um, is I only need the acquire because I'm using some data here, and I need to protect that data. I need to protect what happens after I acquire it. The, I don't need anything about what happened before. I will see locked. If lock got set before, I will see that because I'm doing an atomic operation with an atomic variable. So speaking of reading between the lines, it turns out we have to read between the tokens because you have things like count plus plus. And that is, of course, counting as count plus one, which you know probably looks something like read the memory at count put it in a register, incre increment it, and then write it back out. And now we have this problem of, you know, things, other threads can happen in between these lines of code. So we now have to read between the tokens, right? And what are we going to do about this problem? Well, we're going to use standard atomic. We just say plus plus, and magically that's overloaded to be atomic. But, uh, you know, curiosity killed the cat. I'd like to know how this plus plus magically works. <coughs> Maybe there's a magic keyword or there's transactional memory and 
or some other keyword they might decide to use. Um, this is for people who went to the transactional memory talk. Uh, you know, maybe we could just somehow say, do this all magically and atomically. We don't get that yet in C++, so that doesn't work. More likely, there could be processor magic that just says, do some ASM instruction that does this in one instruction and makes it atomic and just handle it for me. Um, I don't know what ASM language that is. I just made that up. Um, but more likely, well, actually this is fairly likely. A lot of processors will do this for you and in, 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 in take care of it. But if it doesn't, then we're back to, we have something like this, we have to make this atomic knowing that another thread could come in and set count on us. So we could read count as 10, decide to make it 11, meanwhile it gets changed to 15 and we set it to 11 and we've lost our count and if this was a reference count it should be 16 and now it's 11 and we're screwed. So we want to make sure this is atomic. So we've got our friend compare exchange, right? We realize the problem is in here, we need to make this atomic and not let anyone get through. So let's do something where we plan ahead, we decide what our new value is going to be, and we say, you know what, if the count is still 10, set it to 11, and don't let anyone set it to 15 in, in between me seeing 10 and, and making it 11. And ignore the fact that new is a keyword, just pretend that's a variable. Oh <laughs> um, well, yeah, but register, that, that actually, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm using that as not the keyword register, but to make you think that this is happening in a register, but Technically, that's probably valid. Um, so this is great. We've we've uh, we've gotten rid of the the hole, the gap between the lines of code. But you know, if this fails, we didn't actually increment anything. So you know, we we might say, is it still ten? No, it's twelve. Okay, well, don't set it to anything, and we need to try again, right? So we'll say, hey, if I can't set it from ten to eleven, I always like putting go tos in my uh, presentations. <laughs> Uh, you know, if I can't set it from 10 to 11, I'll try again. I'll have to read it again to see what it is now and say, oh, now it's 15. Well, let's try 16. Well, is it still 15? Make it 16? Oh, maybe that fails. And I may have to go do this a few times, but eventually um, this is going to succeed. I'm going to get my reference count. We'll, we'll get incremented and we can get out of here. And this is, this is a, a essentially important to the idea of lock-free programming is if this fails, like we don't want to loop around forever trying to set a, var a variable. But the good part is if this fails, it only fails if someone else has, has incremented the variable on us, which means another thread is, is making progress. And that's basically the definition of lock free is at least one of your threads is getting somewhere, right? Yes? Doesn't compare exchange automatically reload? Yes. So I'm, I'm using like a, my own style of compare exchange here. But um, to do this nicely, you can do a version of compare exchange where it reloads old for you, so you don't have to reread it. And you can also decide what the memory ordering is when it fails, what the memory ordering is when it doesn't fail. I just wanted to make it explicit as to what's happening there. Um, so, you know, we'll get rid of our go to, we'll get rid of our register, I'll even fix my bug there. And this is what atomic increment looks like. And um, speaking of memory ordering, I'm claiming that this can be relaxed because I know I'm going to do a compare exchange on it later and you know if this doesn't give me the new value then I'll notice it and the real question is, do I have that question there? No. Oh. The real question is what should this memory ordering be and that basically gets to the point, Hans's point of your, once you start using non-sequential memory ordering stuff you start to bleed stuff out of your API because to increment this count I can, I can use, I'm tempted to say I can use memory order relaxed here, but it all depends what you're going to do with this count. If you're using this so to say, I've now got, I, you know, if I'm using this as a, uh, even just as a Boolean to say the data's ready, well then, it depends what the code after this is going to do. If this code after is going to access some data that this is flagging, well then I need memory order acquire so that this data, this code underneath actually happens afterwards. So, you know, what, what memory order I need here depends on what the code outside of this function is doing. And that's why things start to bleed. And, you know, one of the things to do is to just make that sequentially consistent so you don't have to worry about it. But uh, cool. uh, could you back up just one? It's the same, but... Okay. Well, what, what I think I hear you saying is that 
is that you might be using these atomics to control ordering within a single thread. Because outside this function, you might be using some of the, the results of this function. Nope, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that I'm going to use this. This isn't for a single thread. I mean, obviously, it gets used by a single thread, but it's also being used by multiple threads. The idea is, if this count, you know, it, it wouldn't make sense to use a count as just a flag to say the data's ready, but you could, right? Maybe it only ever goes from zero to one. So one thread sets the count, increments the count up to say the data is ready, and another thread comes in and looks at the count. Right, I understand about the, the multi-thread situation, but then you said you would need a different memory ordering flag if you were going to, outside this function, go look at something that the count was flagged. Did you not? Yeah, I think you're, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if whether I'm just wrong or not explaining well. Um, or I don't have a good example, and I, I don't have a slide of a good example, and I can't describe a good example in, in short order. But the general idea of you're using this count to mean something, and then after you've incremented the count, you go and do what you want to do, well, you're relying on those two operations happening. Yeah, you, you might need a separate flag. One would hope that, that the single-threaded memory model would guarantee Yes, it. yeah, you're right. In the single-threaded case, you're guaranteed. It's maybe more of the code above, right? I set my data, and I increment to say the data is ready. I would need a, an acquire on that to make, or a release on that to say yes, you know. I, I have, I, I've allocated my smart pointer, I've allocated my memory, okay. and then I increment my reference count, and now other people can read that smart pointer. So yeah, so, so the better example is I need to, I might need a release on this because I've allocated and published my smart pointer. Okay. Thank you. So does the operator plus plus also have uh, memory order parameters? Yeah, obviously not. Obviously not as operator plus plus, but I think there's a an increment function with memory ordering on it. Yeah. So you have to use a normal operation operator. The full the full syntax of the operator. Yeah. Dot operator plus plus yes. open paren yeah. whatever. Yeah, that's I what I meant. I don't think that's legal. No. Yeah, I don't think you can add parameters to that. It's yeah. called load increment. Load or yeah. increment. Okay. Fetch and add. Fetch thing. and add something yeah. like that. So the main reason I wanted to show the innards of plus plus is because this ends up being a common idiom in lock-free programming, and it's called the CAS loop because we end up casing, compare exchanging, and trying again until we get it, and. Just to make sure this gets burned into your head, what we always do in these cases is we, we have some global thing that we're trying to work with, we read it, act on it locally, and then CAS it globally, right? We want to do all our actions locally and CAS globally. So, you know, there's the environmentally green, think global, act local, and I like to think act local, CAS global. And this is what you do in lock-free programming all day long. So, we'll see more examples later. Um, and like I mentioned before, CAS has a bunch of parameters and crazy stuff and a bunch of memory uh, orderings that you can apply on it. But I tend to, in some of my slides further, I'm just going to write CAS and, you know, we'll sometimes assume that it's a good memory order or leave it as a question as to what memory order should be used. Right? So that's all I'm going to say there. So let's actually, this is basically, that was a different way of covering what I covered last year. And this is what I didn't get to last year. So the simplest, probably the simplest lock-free data structure is a lock-free stack. And you can imagine your stack that looks like this. You've got a head and it points to some nodes and it's a single link list basically. And we want to push a new value onto our, our link list. So we allocate a new node and there it is. We then uh, take a look at what the old what the head used to look like. And we make the new node point to the same place the head was pointing to. So it's ready. And at this point, everything we've done, do I have a slide for that? Nope. Everything we've done so far, these uh, yellow stuff, is all locally. We're not, we haven't exposed new node to anyone. It's all local variables. And then at the last step, what we want to do is take this uh, pointer here and make it point down here, right? But we want to do that with a CAS, with, okay, no, not, not a CAS. So we just do it. We just set that 
to the new node, right? And we write the new head, and now we've got our new. So that's the way a normal push would work, but that doesn't work in lock-free programming. Because in here, you know, things may have changed before we set this new node in there. So what we have to do instead is use a CAS because we're, um, that's where all this local work happens, gets exposed globally. We're publishing this new node out to everyone else through the shared stack. So we prep everything and we CAS and we say, if the old head, which is this dotted line, equals, or if the head of the stack, the current head of the stack, equals what it used to equal when we started, then you're free to swap it to point here because nothing happened in between, okay? And that's the simplest bit of lock-free programming you'll probably do, and that works, and um, I leave it as a question as what kind of memory ordering do we need on this CAS? Do we need memory orderings on anything else? Um, but, you know, burn that into your head because that's how you push on a lock-free stack. And you are publishing the new node, so you have to make public. Run. Yeah, you know, most likely I'm going to do a, a, release. a release on this because, yeah, I'm publishing data that I've. Here's my new data. I'm publishing the new data, so I release the new data out to the world. I got a question? Yes. Uh, what if an another thread changes to the yet, but it has the same address as you had? Well, in this case, the new head can't have the same address as the old head because the old head's right there, right? And we're just, um, yeah. The, the, this, this, this address is here. No one else is going to go add this address to the stack because you've allocated it already. You, you own this. Wait, t wait till we get to, to uh, pop. Um, like, what if, what if we have um, some thread that's, I mean, what if we're garbage collecting our nodes? And so somebody, some of thread, we have many, many threads, and one of the threads um, is thinking that the, the latest node is something that's already been popped and then garbage collected. This, up, up to before the CAS, this new node is owned by this guy right here. And I'm hoping garbage collection doesn't take that away on me because I just allocated it, right? And I'm holding it in my local variable. So I own this pointer and no one can reuse it for anything at this point. I think the only thing that can happen is other people can come in and push new stuff, and then the CAS will fail because, you know, the head has changed and we've got new nodes added in here. But they won't be using this one because it's mine. But I think you guys are ahead of yourself because um, wait till we get to pop. So basically, the idea is here's all our local work, and we're holding this locally, and then we CAS it globally, and that's when we publish the new node. Now the new node has become part of our, our, our uh, list or stack. So, pop. Same thing, we uh, get ready, we look at what the head is. We have to skip across because we're gonna get rid of this node, so we're, this is, we're hoping this to be our, the new head. And um, right away we already have a problem because we can't just, if this is null, we're gonna walk off the end of the planet. So we'll check for null and then we'll do this. And even this, we already have a problem because, oh, old, old head's not null. Well, now it is, right? Because some other thread could change it between here and there. And believe it or not, I'm going to hand wave that one. Um, because in many cases, you can get rid of this in many different ways that I don't want to get into. Um, last time I implemented this, I was the allocator. And this, the whole point of this was to be the allocator. So I know whether this thing has gone away or not. Um, and in some, some systems, it's okay to say, well, you know what, I'm just reading this. It's kind of gone back to the allocator, but, you know, it's a very scary way of doing it. Um, <laughs> in other ways, things are put into a free list f to be f actually freed later, stuff like that. Um, but that's not even the biggest problem I want to get to. So let's imagine that's okay. And now we CAS, right? Just same as before, we say, hey, if the head hasn't changed at all, Let's jump to here and let's get rid of this node. And so what's wrong with this code? And I think you guys were hinting at it. And the problem with this code is in a word, ABA. And you can decide whether that's a word or not. 
the double B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then it's a band, yes. Yeah. Um, so now let's imagine we're going through this and our thread gets to this point. We've got everything set up. We've got old head ready and new head is ready. And we're right here and another thread jumps in on us. And we wake up and what we see is the whole stack has changed on us. The, you know, these nodes have gotten removed and some new nodes have gotten added. And then we do our CAS. And luckily our CAS will fail because head has changed, right? So it's like, oh, whoa, look, everything's changed between here and there. So let's try again, right? So let's go back up, we try again. And this time, this old node, you know, it, let's say it got deleted. Who knows what happened to that one, but this one got deleted. So head has changed. And then the, the uh, memory allocator decided to reuse this node and this is all happening on the other thread. It puts the node back in as a new, a new value and it comes back in his head again. So what's happened is head was pointing here and you were setting everything up, you're ready to go. Head starts pointing over here for a while while you're sleeping and then head points back to this, new, this same pointer again because it gets reused by the allocator. And now you do your CAS and the CAS succeeds, right? It's like, yay, the CAS succeeded. And now head points to here and all these nodes that used to be in your list are just floating away and you've lost them all. <laughs> and this is called ABA because the head pointer was a value A. When you weren't looking, it became B. And then it came back to A and you think nothing has changed because it's still A. And your whole world has changed and our friend Kaz has issues because it can't detect that uh, old head has changed on you and came back. So what do we do about this problem? And this is why I say, you know, the push was a simple case. You didn't, you don't get that problem. And all we're trying to do is make a stack, which is a very simple structure. And we already have this insane problem to deal with. There's a thing called, in various different num uh, letters for this, but I like to call it DW CAS, double wide CAS, where basically instead of swapping a pointer or an integer, we swap two machine words at a time stuck together. So basically if you have 32-bit pointers, maybe you can swap 64-bit values at once. Or if you have 64-bit pointers, you need to swap 128-bit values at once. And this can be used, if your processor has it, to solve this CAS problem. And how do we solve this problem? Well, we take our double wide 64 bits of memory, we make half of it a counter and half of it the pointer, all right? And now, when we do our magic stuff, we don't have a pointer anymore. We've got this pointer plus a uh, counter. And magically, this double CAS, which checks both the pointer and the, CAS and the counter atomically, what happens is it's going to pass correctly because when we allocate our pointer, every time we go get a new node, which might get recycled by the allocator and be the same pointer we saw before, we're going to make it unique by incrementing a global count in our, you know, pointer maintainer so that basically what this does is make every pointer you ever see is a unique pointer. Now, not every pointer you ever see is a unique pointer because your count is going to roll over, hopefully 2 to the 32 or 2 to the 64 times later, which seems like a long time, but remember that on a 4 gigahertz machine, you can count up to 4 billion in a second. So some people actually don't even like this because they say there's too much risk in a 32-bit value rolling over. Most cases, I think it's, it's not a worry because you need both things to align. Reuse the same pointer and reuse the same pointer four billion times after the last time I used it. So. Wouldn't, you be, wouldn't it be enough to check the, the head pointer and the next pointer on the, on the top node? Why? Those haven't changed. I, but but they are not consecutive in memory, so you would have to do a double cast, right? I, I well, so you're asking if you can check the head pointer and the next pointer. Now, w one question: I'm not sure whether you would have to end up checking the whole list, but um, <laughs> no, probably not. Just uh, that one item, right? So if that's still the head, and it's still got the same next, then the thing you're putting in instead is the new head is the right thing. Right, so I think th th the problem is I can't check those two things at the same time. Because they're not contiguous? They're not contiguous. You didn't mention that that was a requirement. Ah, uh, nice. That, that was, that's my bad uh, diagram here is pretend that these two are stuck together in memory. They're side by side. Um, there are systems, at least in theory, that let you do 
check two variables, un whatever side, uncontiguous, um, in atomically, but that'd be great. We could do tons more work, but you know, you can't actually buy one of those systems. <laughs> no, I don't even know if they exist. They're nice in theory. Uh, I see. Yeah. So that is pop from a stack, and that's a lock-free stack. And what ends up happening is every other, what you tend to end up doing is making more complicated uh, lock-free structures. And as you're doing those more complicated structures, like, oh, I can't free this right now because it might disappear. So I'll put it in my lock-free stack. And you end up reusing this thing over and over again to make more complicated structures. Um, why do you not have to use dbcath for, for the push thing? Because well, uh, yeah. In, in this case, I'll have the same problem on the push. Yeah, yeah I'll have to make the push use dwcath and, and it'll be using you know the node pointer and but, but in a garbage collected uh, situation, you in a garbage could collector, avoid that because you yeah. could hold up uh, a reference to that to the old pointer. To, to, yeah. yeah, yeah. In a garbage collected case, right here, you're holding the old head, so it actually won't get reused on you. Garbage collection actually makes a lot of lock-free programming easier, sadly. So let's just hop over to a circular queue. Um, and circular queues tend to look something like that. I've got some data items in it and head and tail and basically we're imagining that this wraps around to there. And a single threaded circular queue could look like this where head and tail instead of being pointers are just indexes into my array. And you know, I check if I'm full, I check if I, I'm empty and uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter exactly this code, but uh, this is just a quick implementation of a single threaded queue. Um, if you look closely, this means that I'm leaving a, an empty spot between head and tail, because it's hard to tell whether, if head and tail are equal, it's hard to tell whether it's full or whether it's empty. Um, and if you look close enough, you'll see that there was, that was a bug, that tail equals head minus one, because one might be on the end, end of the array, the other one might be on the other end, end of the array, and you actually need to do a little more but it's still trying to say the same thing. If tail's right behind head, that means we're full and we can't push anymore. And you might want to do various things, but let's just imagine we're just going to return. And we check for the uh, empty case on pop. So let's try to make this uh, atomic circular queue. So, you know, our friend atomic, why don't we just throw that at the problem? Seems like that's what we like to do. And does this work? And kind of one of the things Dave was mentioning, um, Problem is, we're trying to check if, hail, if tail is somehow related to head, and I need to do two atomics at the same time, and you can't do that. You can, if you notice all the other examples in the past, we're always like, check if data is ready. We're only checking one atomic at a time. Uh, here, we need to read two atomics and compare two atomics, and by the time you've read this one, this one might have changed on you. You go read that, this has changed. You can't actually do this uh, atomically. So you have the same problem on the, on the pop. And we can't, basically we can't use this model. So let's change this around a little bit. And now let's put zeros wherever we're not using stuff in our queue. And now we don't have to compare head and tail. We'll just look if, if tail is pointing at zero, that means it's, an, it's an unoccupied and I can reuse it. If it's not null, then we must have wrapped around and, and it's already in use and we're full. Same thing on our pop, we, uh, we check if if there's some place to put something. And um, also on the pop, we have to null it back out once we pop it off. So if we pop off A, we put a zero in there to say that's available. Yes? Doesn't it work just to, to store the thing as a, as a head and a length? So that you can, or you know, the number of elements remaining available in the queue, so you can check to see whether that's zero and that's single check? Uh, head and the length would possibly work. <coughs> um, I'll think about that, whether you get the problem of checking them both at the same time. Or, I mean, in general, in lock-free data structures, if you try to figure out, if you have a function that tells you what the size of the lock-free data structure is, it's probably wrong. Because it's like, so, it, it, I always tell people that if I have a, some lock-free container, 
and it has a function like empty, you know, is this container empty? I don't call it empty, I don't call it is empty, I call it was empty. Right. It's like, well, it was an empty a second ago, I don't know what the value is now, right? Okay. Um, but I have to think more about whether a head plus a length could maybe work. Um, I basically did it this way because I wanted to, I'm driving towards a conclusion, so. Okay. Um, one little rearrangement of code down here. I'm going to, I'm going to, instead of checking for head and then reading head again, I'll just read it once into item, and if it's zero, then I return. You can argue whether this is better or worse from an API point of view, because on pop, I return false, and I do set your item, and I set it to null, so there's two ways of checking that it failed. That could be good or bad. Some people might want to say, well, if, if there's nothing there, don't mess with my item. I don't know. Um, but it just happens to work better. We only read head once here. We can check it locally. So now let's make everything in here atomic, which seems a little heavyweight, but atomic ints aren't any bigger than normal ints. It's just the operations that you do on them. So everything's atomic, and now we will... Uh, so first thing was this is a sequential or a single threaded circular queue of non-zero ints. We've gotten more specific here. Zero has to be special and it's single threaded. Try to make this uh, multi-threaded. So we load our same code. We try to see if tail is pointing to zero or not with a load. And if we're good, we'll store our new value there. And on pop, we'll check it with a load and store our null there when, after we're done using it. And the question is, what memory ordering do we need to make this all work? And this is where it gets really interesting, I think. That's why I like this example. I'm going to claim that these can all be relaxed. And basically, to a certain extent, this code, as long as these, all I'm using atomics for is to make sure that these sets happen you know, I don't write half the int and the other half of the int and ensure that it actually eventually gets sent out to memory and read by the other guy sooner or later. And why does this work and why can I only use relaxed here? And it's very, very specific. Um, I kind of hinted earlier that this depends on what you're doing with your data, right? And in this case, it's my data is just integers. They're not like pointers to something else over there. And um, to me, the really interesting part being that this thread over here only ever looks at tail, never looks at head, and only ever looks to see if the value's non-zero. And the only guy who can make it non-zero is this thread. So before I get too further, before we can decide, I just remember something, before we can decide whether this is actually correct or not, we have to answer this question up here. What kind of queue do I have here? I'm claiming this is an SBSC queue, and this is what you see all the time in lock reprogramming. This is single producer, single consumer, con circular, lock, circular queue of non-zero ints. So we're getting very specific, and we're narrowing down our problem, which is what we have a tendency to do in lock reprogramming, and saying we only ever have one guy Pushing data, we only ever have one thread pulling data. Um, and you'll see, the other thing you'll see is M's in here, meaning multi-producer, multi-consumer. And you can have all different combinations. And the more M's you stick in here, the more complicated your, your uh, queue gets. Um, so that's the key to saying, if I am pushing and I see this as non-zero, I must be the guy who put that non-zero in there. I don't have to worry about seeing what the other thread did. If I happen to see a zero there, well, I know the other thread did that because I never put zeros in. So it's, we're kind of cheating the whole system. And sometimes people think it's, it's, it's a scary way to think about things, but sometimes people think about, I almost don't want to explain it this way because it's a bad way of, of you don't want to go too far down this road. But a lot of times people think of threading, lock-free programming as, oh, I'm reading stale data. It's been changed over there by the other thread, but I don't see it yet. And that gets really, you know, the, the definition of what, means, what it means to be visible and stuff like that gets really kind of hairy. But your gut instinct when you start thinking that way is that, wait a second, some other thread might have changed that and you just haven't, haven't noticed it yet because you're using re relaxed. And it's like, that's okay. All that means is that if it has changed and I don't see it yet, then I can't push, I will fail, and 
you know, that means you were pushing and popping so close together that, well, it was full a, a moment ago. You haven't noticed that there's an empty spot, but what's the difference? You're, you know, you, in your code outside of here, you can't tell what a moment ago was. Um, so, push happens in one thread always. Yes, and single and thread. And pop happens in another thread. And what, so one thread only accesses tail and the other only accesses head? Or yes. Have I missed anything? Yep. Okay. Only accesses head. So you need all they those. Don't share yeah, they don't share. What they share is is the yeah. the data itself, and all they share about it is is it zero or is it non-zero? And they're very careful to one guy only sets it to zero, the other guy only sets it to non-zero. And basically, the whole point here is that <laughs> we've really narrowed down the problem so that we can get something done. And you're always constantly making compromises in lock free programming. So this would work great if you know. You were just trying to get characters from a keyboard from one thread and then process them in another thread or something. But, but what about the visibility of the item itself? Either you see the item mm -hmm. or you don't see the item. So <laughs> the next question is, what happens if I make this a circular queue of non-null pointers? How is that any different than, you know, pointers are just integers. There's fancy integers. So let's say instead of having characters in here, I put pointers in here. So all I have to do is make this uh, item star and you know do item star over here and in, in item pointer and all the code is the same except for I changed ints to item stars. There's absolutely no difference as long as the things being pointed to are never changed their lifetime. Or yeah, yeah, which is so unlikely to be the case. You know, you're using these pointers for a reason. You're putting them in a queue because some other guy's going to read them. You probably wrote them, and this is broken just because you stuck pointers in here, right? And that's another thing of where your library leaks out what does it mean to be consistent. It's like, well, this, this library, this circular key works great if you put ints in it. Oh, but if you're taking those ints and not using them directly, but you're taking those ints and referencing some other array, which has different data in it, changing data, well, then a circular queue of ints doesn't work that way. I would have to change my ordering. So it gets very, very specific to your problem, and you totally leak out your memory orderings out of your APIs. Um, in particular, these are the bad orderings for the pointers. And since I'm pushing an item that I just wrote probably into this queue for someone else to use, I want to publish, I'm publishing this item via a queue. Here's some new data, put it in the queue. You guy over there, you're going to read that data. So I'll release the data, I'll publish it globally at this point. And then on the pop, the pop acquires that data that I pushed and we need an acquire barrier. But couldn't you have re released uh, or published the item before you push it? Yeah, could I do this release? Could I put a barrier? Could I use this and put the barrier outside of the library? And I'm tempted to say no. Well, I think you can. I think you can. Yeah, I think that's the whole point. If it's relaxed, then you want to use fences to force the... Uh, yeah, in, in this case, I think you can. I'm trying to think of the case where it fails. I think you're going to over-specify the memory ordering by doing that, but uh, I think there's probably a way you can make it work for fences. There's, yeah, there's a really good case, and I, there's no way I can describe it now, in, on comp programming threads. Not this. This case would probably work. You can just do your, you know, you write your data outside before you push it. You put a, you put a, you, know, you can, the language also allows you to put, explicit fences into. You just stick an explicit fence saying, hey, I've written this data. Make sure it's pushed out before we do anything else. And then we can do this work relaxed. Um, I, I'm trying to think of, there's a case I saw where either that's just less efficient, um, particularly where you're, if you're looping around. Does the, it, does the memory order relaxed operation have any ordering with respect to that fence? It's still after that fence. Well, actually, no. That's, that's, that's if not, then that would be the problem. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's one of the problems right there. Um, so right now, I need a release here. If I did my release outside of this function, and I read, wrote my data outside this function, did my release, and then did all this stuff, then even though this is way over here in some other library, all this code could drift up before the release, because release is only saying what happens before happens before. 
I don't care about what happens after. So all this could get drifted up above. So if you want to do this outside of here, you have to do a full sequential consistent memory ordering. If you do it inside at the right spot, you can just do a release. I think I followed the release in the acquire. What's the effect of memory order, relax, on sequential consistency? Memory order, re <coughs> memory order relax doesn't... It, memory order relax lets everything order around it. It doesn't have any ordering constraints. All it does is make sure, the only thing you're ordering is reading this thing. So if I read this here and I store this here, because these are atomic variables, this will get ordered properly. But every, anything else can get moved around. Shouldn't that in the second store, uh, shouldn't that be store zero to array head instead of the item pointer? Yes. Thank you. This, this should be a zero here. Late, late night. Actually, that's the last. But uh, the question is, uh, <clears throat> I mean, Hans mentioned that memory order relaxed doesn't guarantee that you won't read a value that hasn't been written there at all. Would well, that break this? Yeah. So memory order relaxed does get a heat out. Yeah, you, there, it's still, yeah, you're, you're still ordered on this variable. This variable is still ordered on its own. Every access to this variable that's happened on, on all threads mm -hmm. is either seen or not seen. You can't, you can't just have some random value show up or something like that. If that helps, probably not. True. I think so. Yeah, we'll have to say, ask him. <laughs> Yes? So, if I understand right, memory order relaxed is as though you have, is as though you have a mutex on that. Well, no, because the mutex synchronizes other stuff around it too, right? Well, mutexes don't synchronize a lot of stuff around them. Oh, they don't? Okay. Because, so let's say, yeah. Let's say, let me make my assertion anyway, even if it's wrong. You, you can correct me, I hope. Um, memory, saying memory order relaxed is as though you just had a mutex on that one thing and you're not guaranteeing anything about its consistency with other things around it. Yeah. But it makes it legal to read and write it simultaneously. Yep. And that's all it does. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a good point. So memory order relaxed looks like I put a lock on this one variable, and it only protects this one variable. And I lock it, change it, and unlock it. So how does that magically still allow this stuff to be reordered? And that is because when you lock something and unlock, any code that's up here and any code that's down here can drift inside the lock. They can't drift past. Every, anything that gets in the lock can't drift out, but things can drift in. So if this was implemented as a lock on this one variable, other code that happened before could be inside that lock, and this code down here could be inside that lock. And you also pass the, pass the load itself, right? You could drift inside the lock and pass the... Yeah, the it could come before or after the load. Okay. Be just somewhere in the lock. No, I'm... I actually disagree with yeah. this. I, I mean, if you just use locks that preserve sequential consistency, uh, that's guaranteed to preserve sequential consistency. I mean, On that variable? Uh, no, lock and unlock in your program preserves sequential the, consistency completely. They don't you use this lock and unlock. Uh, your program behaves as though, and there are no databases. Well, lock and unlock only have release and acquire semantics. Yes? Right, but that's not visible. Right. For database free programs. So you have the same, so I mean, the, the argument about drifting applies uh, with respect to ordinary data, but that you can't tell because of the database free restriction. With respect to me other memory order relaxed restrictions, the, with respect to memory order, if you have two memory like, order relaxed the, operations, they yeah. can drift past each other. Uh, but if they acquired, if they acquired locks on different, uh, a lock that's specific to the item being updated, they wouldn't be able to drift past each other. Mm. So yeah. there, there's, there's a difference. I think it's not the same as acquiring a lock that's specific to the item for each one. It's not even as strong as that. No, it's much weaker than that. Yeah. The, the, the okay. specific item is actually full sequential consistency. Okay. 
Yeah, so this is weaker than a lock on that object because if I'm also doing an atomic on some other value somewhere, the rules on whether those can drift around or not is different based this. Uh, so we do all this work and we make this lock free very specific queue and I would probably guarantee that this is oftentimes slower than just using locks. <laughs> And there, there's, a, there's some, um, it, it completely depends how many, well, in this case we know there's only two threads. But in general, it depends how many threads, how often they're contending, stuff like that. Um, and there's papers out there about how certain algorithms will always be best using locks, no matter what you try to do, it seems. Um, uh, the interesting part in this case is, has to do with a thing called false sharing. And I've put these all into an array, and these values are all side by side. And on the push, we might be atomically checking this one. And on the pop, we're atomically checking that one. And down at the processor level, those are on the same cache line. And a lot of atomic operations tend out, turn out to be, let's lock a cache line so I can do this atomically. And you know the standard doesn't expose that. None of this code exposes that. But you, what that's called is false sharing, where two independent variables are sitting side by side. They could just be. You know, I've got two variables in my data structure, one after the other, and I'm trying to do atomic operations on both those variables. Darn, you put them side by side. You should have moved them. You put them one at the top of the struct, one at the bottom of the struct, you might have a faster program. So that's called false sharing. And an interesting thing in, in this would be change this number from one to five, and you might get rid of false sharing. You will still walk your queue, but you'll be walking in jumps and coming around, and if I got my math correct, it's like a, a cyclic group. If, if assuming that this Q is like a power of two or something, it's it's a co prime or whatever. It's you know with the, their paired primes. Uh, then I could skip every four items, and then have less chance of items being side by side or something like that. May or may not help you. Okay. Uh, the 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 number of items is uniformly distributed over time. It doesn't matter what, it shouldn't matter what the... Yeah, it, 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 I mean, you get, there's two things that are going... In this case, it probably doesn't matter a lot because it really matters where head and tail are, right? And as long as they're far apart, you're good. If they get close together, it's bad. Well, you can just say that you're required to keep four or five elements zero instead of just one. And I think that would keep them far enough apart. At, at least until the, until except for the empty yeah. empty case, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't know. I just wanted to mention that as a general problem of false sharing. Um, and my phone shut off on me. Let's see if I can still. Oh, I can. So basically, that's the end. I wanted to put this back up again to remind you to not do lock free programming. <laughs> um, the whole point of this was, like, I hope ABA at least scares you enough and reordering things behind your back scares you enough to think twice about doing this stuff. Um, and subtle problems of, of, you know, what memory ordering do I need depending on what the user is doing. Um, I, I yes? I think you, you missed step zero, which is don't use concurrency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, I think we're past that. And now, nowadays, with the number of processors on your machine, processors aren't getting faster, they're just getting more plentiful. So we're stuck doing threading, but I, I agree. Zero. Um, and my last thing is use locks, because it's much easier to think about. And um, that's the end. And the other thing I usually have on here is the line that says, I'm not an expert. So like Hans said, only experts should be doing this, and experts get it wrong. I don't consider myself an expert, so... so you don't get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I don't get yeah. it. Um, go to comp programming threads if you ever have any idea of lock-free stuff and if you think you've wrote, written a lock-free algorithm, post it there and then they'll tear you apart. <laughs> <laughs> I know from experience. Um, and next year, that's a little plug for next year, um, I'm hoping to give a whole different talk next year. and Maybe this won't happen, but... I want to give a talk on how I code and why. I mentioned this on the boost list of I want not just me, but people, and I've talked to Rob, maybe someone else, and a couple people would like to give a talk on just 10, 15 minutes of here's one example of why I code the way I do. And uh, this is my plug so that at the end of this, come talk to me and 
let's do this. And that's the end. Questions? More questions? <laughs> questions? So, in library in a week, we're going to be looking at the lock free library tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I will show up. Has some of the uh, very data structures that you were doing. And I was kind of looking at the code as you were displaying it on the screen here. And it's a little, little different, but similar. Um, so, I guess. Part of the question would be, you know, um, given that we're not going to be using lock-free programming, uh, would it be okay to use lock-free programming if we don't actually have to write the complicated thing? Yes. This is I, I, it, last year's slide. The other, the other part of my rules of my other rule that should be on here is use boost, right? My, I used to always say use locks, and if you can't use locks, use boost. Like use boost once instead of trying to write your own. Uh, Lazy singleton or something like that, right? So yeah, exactly. If we get a lock-free library, then stop worrying about this. Just use the lock-free library available to you. Um, only scary part about that is if you start throwing, don't forget this. You, you can start throwing lock-free libraries at your problem, and you're much better off changing your algorithm first and stop sharing so much data. Um, the example for this I, I wanted to give was just simple things like, you know, sim maybe not very realistic examples, but you know, I, I need to count how many red pixels are in this image. So break up the image into quadrants and have 10 threads all go look at their area. And the, the naive implementation of that is thread one goes, hey, I found a red, set it to one. Thread two goes, hey, I found a red, okay, set it to two. And you just keep everyone hammering on this count. So well, don't do it that way. Have your thread temporarily count up, hey, I found 100 of them. And the other thread, I found 200. And at the end of it all, add them all up, right? And over and over again, you can change your algorithm to work more like that instead of hammering on a variable that's, that you're trying to share. And that'll get you more than... than and, and the problem with all the lock-free, you start doing lock-free stacks and queues and stuff, well, that's your, that's your point of contention. Well, so, right? I mean, it's not... If you want to make use of threading, right, I mean, the, the availability of a queue, which allows you to pass work between threads, is a pretty useful construct. Yeah. It, Overall, it, you can see that, you know, you can go read about patterns, you can go look at implementations of things, and you'll see that used over and over again. So, I think, just as a general thing, that's good. And I think you've given us some very important things that we need to ask Tim, who's the author of Boost Log Free, you know, what, what he's done. So, and I guess the, the follow-on to my question was, what would your advice be, and this is really for Hartman, <laughs> about how to actually inspect this library to have some idea whether it's even going to work? How, how to inspect the lock-free library? Yeah. Um, because it seems almost so, an intractable problem. Yeah, for one, you have to write tests, right? Yeah. And then you'll find that your tests aren't sufficient. Mm -hmm. Because, right. I mean, the whole point of the whole sequential consistency stuff is that, you know, if we have to look at every line of code and interleave it with every possibility of every other line of code, we can't do that. So we start using locks to make big blocks of code, and then we only have to interleave a few blocks of code to see what happens, right? That we can reason with. We go to lock free, suddenly it's like, interleave every line of code and tell me that they're all correct. And basically that's what people do in lock free programming, is stare at code for hours and hours. I've, st I've stared at two lines of lock free code for over an hour, trying to figure out which line had the bug in it. But even this is not enough. Because even if you try all possible interleavings, you also have to try all possible. Uh, what is this stuff gonna read? Yeah, is and it gonna see this right or that yeah. right? Yeah, and and when you when you do all the in possible interleavings, then go and do it on all the other platforms. Yeah, right? right, exactly. So there is one thing out there called Relacy. Okay. Um, I think it's written by that uh, Dimitri guy that you, that you've gone back and forth with a bit, mm -hmm. um, and it basically tries to do this for you. It uh, has a model of the most relaxed memory model that is valid and runs your code and makes the worst possible you know assumptions about your code and then says nope you have a bug or no you don't I, you know th now you have to turn around and prove that that is correct the relacy but assuming that's working fairly well then you can reason about your code but the other thing to do is have a bunch of people look at it and put it on comp programming threads so people who are used to seeing this stuff the one thing I should say is, when you're interleaving all your lines of code, you often you don't have to interleave every single line. You have to interleave the lines that publish and read, right? It's the memory accesses that you really have to worry about interleaving. So basically, after a while, you get used to 
reading code that way. Dave? Thank you. I want to know what the difference between doing lock free programming using a lock free library full of atomic data structures and doing lock free programming using the atomic primitives that we have is why is it why is it safe to do it with the library just because you gave me a lock free queue that's an atomic queue it's just like the I, I understand there's a difference I just don't understand why uh, I think the main difference is that you you have some eventually you have some faith in the lock free library being correct you have I have total faith in the lock free integers being correct okay it's your use of them though right if i try to oh i've got this problem where where my locks are getting are are slowing me down mm -hmm. and it's like oh i should i should do some lock free mechanism here and maybe it's very specific to the problem and yes i'll just write some lock free thing for this small case but if it's like oh i've I have my queue and all my workers you know, push data into the queue and then I have worker threads that pull data out of the queue and I realize there's a bunch of content contention on this queue, I go, well, I should get rid of that lock around the queue because everyone stops and I'll just stick in a lock-free queue that someone else wrote for me, right? And maybe that will solve my problem. Now, that goes back to the same idea of maybe that won't solve your problem. Maybe you should have a, th a queue on every thread and one guy who pushes spreads it out across threads and then you have all this, well, what if one thread gets all the work and he's slow and these threads are all empty? Can I, can I rebalance my threads? And you get in these, you know, it's called work sharing and work stealing. And, you know, but it goes back to, you know, look at your algorithm. Should you have one queue? You know, sure, you can stick in a lock-free queue and you might get some benefit, but maybe you should change the way your algorithm works first, right? Did I go off on a tangent on you? Not completely. Um, no, I mean, I think what you're saying is, is if you know your program's already correct, replacing a, a thing with equivalent functionality that uses lock free mechanisms under the covers is a safe. Sure. Well, yeah. Like if you're if you if you have a lock right now and all you're doing is protecting a counter, it's like well make that counter an atomic counter, and you're fine. But usually what happens is I've got a lock on a big thing, and while I make it lock free, I'm also going to change the way everything works. And suddenly it starts getting, so that's why it makes it, if I can just plug in a lock-free queue in place of a locked queue, yeah, if your code was all correct, your code should still all be correct. But right. if you try to do, do lock-free yourself, you tend to change your algorithm and make it lock-free, and then you're wandering in bad territory. I have a general comment on this list. Yeah. That there should be one more item, uh, infinity plus one, measure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I wanted to mention that. Guarantee you that yes. free will be faster than I, whatever you did. In my head, I, usually I give myself lots of hints to say what I wanted to say, uh -huh. and I didn't this year. I kind of just said, "Oh, I'll just remember what to say." Um, yeah. Once you get to this level, you do have to. You know, it would make my it make my algorithm look a lot harder. I should put a go another go to that always <laughs> makes the algorithm better. Um, it should basically jump jump straight into the middle of the loop, right? Yeah. With the lock free and remeasure your lock free because you do. You sometimes you put in lock free and it doesn't it makes things worse. So yes. So with all the fear that you've instilled in me now about lock free programming, what is the typical motivation that you would see for actually ending it, you know, getting to infinity and secondly, um, what is valid motivation? So typical yeah. versus valid. Yeah, what's the motivation for doing lock free? I mean why would I why would I ever want to do that and why would I be tempted to do that and then why should I do that? Um, so I mean the idea here is the way the reason you'd want to do that is because maybe it will be faster. Is you you've really got, you know, some system that's just bogging down and you think, well, you know what, I, I First, you measure, you, it's not just measure how fast the system is, it's measure where's the problem. You see, oh, the problem is this contention. Everyone's blocking on this queue and we're all fighting for this queue. And it, maybe it turns out that, you know, only one guy writes the queue and seven guys read the queue. It's like, well, if you're only writing very uh, occasionally, then you could do a reader-writer lock and, and have all the guys who are reading read at the same time. And maybe you start going down the lock-free road that way, right? But it is based on... You've measured, and you've got contention, and you, you're hoping lock-free will uh, get rid of the contention. That would be the good reason to do it. Uh, my reason to do it is because it's interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I, don't, I don't do this at work, usually. Like, well, I, I haven't done lock-free at work for a couple of years. I do, it, I do it for fun. If I understand <laughs> <laughs> the contention and allow 
things to continue. Yeah. Ba basically, in general, using your processor yeah. to do something rather than wait. For something. Yeah. Basically, in general, right? We've got all these processors, and if they're all, you've got all these threads that you could use the processors. But if they all are stopping and waiting for the one guy to do something, then it's like, you might as well write a single threaded program, right? right? If your locks are too big and everyone's waiting for them, get rid of threads. Just make a, you know, you've, you've built yourself a complicated sequential program because everybody locks before he does anything, right? Um, you made me think of something else there. Uh, now did I already lose it? Um, oh, well. Was a good point too, really. <laughs> yes. So, so, as far as I know, ABA, ABA is not a problem on, on anything that has a low link stall conditional architecture. Like yeah, I, I didn't even mention that. So, like if we go look at the compare exchange operator, in a lot of systems, it's called compare exchange at the low level, and then on certain architectures, there's a whole other thing called uh, link load store conditional, which says. Um, you, you say, I, I'm, it's the same idea. It's like, here's that variable that I want to change. So I look at this variable and I, and I do the link load on it. And I say, I'm loading this variable and I'm marking it. Like, watch that variable for me. And you ask the processor to watch it for you. And then when you store on it, you say, hey, did that change? And this is really, did it change at all? Even if it changed back to what it used to be, did it change while I was, you know, sleeping or off doing something? Now I remember what I was going to say over there. Um, and, uh, and, you, you don't need, you don't have to worry about it. It really sees the, it's, if it goes A, B, A, it saw the B and it'll tell you right away, yep, it changed to B. It's, it's A again now, but it changed to B. Um, and that also relates back to one of the reasons why there's compare, um, there's compare exchange weak and compare exchange strong, which I didn't really describe. But one of them can fail even when the value is still A. Compare exchange weak, you say, hey, is it 10? If, it's, if so, make it 11. And it goes, yeah, it was 10, but I'm going to tell you you can't make it 11 anyhow. And you're like, why? It's like, well, because under the hood, it was 10, it went to 15, it went back to 10, and I'm implementing this using link load store conditional, so I have to tell you, I have to fail, because that's the, I can't tell that it's the same. I can tell you that it changed at one point. So the weak one that's the weak, the weak one will fail sometimes, even though the value doesn't look like it changed. The strong one will never fail on you if it's the same, and some implementations will have to loop inside of that to make sure of it. Um, and the other reason for doing lock free is because you've got threads and they grab a lock and the other thread's sleeping. So yeah, you're wasting processor because you're only using one instead of two or something. But then what happens if this other thread dies or something, right? Now the right answer is to code correctly so that you unlock things and blah, blah, blah. But if this other thread dies or the guy holding that lock decides to do, go off and do something else, or what, what you see in real code is the guy grabs a lock and does a callback and just calls code that he doesn't know what it does, and you start getting deadlocks and stuff. With lock free, you won't get the deadlocks because you don't have locks, and you won't have to worry about some thread dying on you and holding a lock forever. So there's some robustness in lock free programming. So if you're writing at, at the OS level, you know, you often want to. Well, and the other thing with lock free, if you're writing at the uh, interrupt level, and you know, you're really limited on what you can do. Sometimes you can still do some lock free programming, but you can't go off and grab locks and go into the kernel and ask the kernel to do stuff for you. Doesn't that, doesn't whether you're gonna deadlock like that depend on really how you code the lock free stuff? Because I was looking, like a lot of your examples were, did I set this thing yet? And, and loop? Well, y usually. You, know, there, you could do it with a loop or you could be, or you could say sleep and try again later. Yeah. But regardless, Unless you have something else to do with the with the other answer, yeah, um, with the answer no, it's not done yet, then you're going to yeah. block something. Yeah, a lot of my simple examples are like you know if the data is ready, use the data. Otherwise, go do something. You know, otherwise fail. Yeah, usually what you're going to do is wait for the data to be ready, and hopefully in that case, just go use a lock, right? That's, that's a lock. Right? Yeah, like and and people will start using spin locks where they're like, is it ready? Is it ready now? Is it ready now? Is it ready now? It's like, uh, you know, don't burn your processor just to do that. Just use a normal lock. There's reasons to use a spin lock sometimes because you don't have to dive into the kernel and blah, 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 blah. But a lock that has no contention on it also doesn't usually dive into the kernel. So, yeah. Um, and the other thing to mention with that is in, a lot, in the normal cases with locks, you do end up looping around a lot with that CAS loop. And then you start worrying about, you know, how's that any different than just 
spinning on a lock, right? It's like I keep trying to do something. Um, it does give you the, know, the knowledge that the other thread did succeed on something and it tends to be more fine grain. You're only spinning on one variable inside of a big structure or something. Um, but it, does, it can happen where, that's why lock free can be slower sometimes, is because there's enough contention that you're constantly trying, you're retrying your CAS loop and never getting anywhere because there's 20 threads all trying to do the same thing. And you get these crazy ideas of, um, uh, I forget what the one word is, but it's um, basically where you do things like sleep but for random amounts of time and, and it's exponential fallbacks and all this stuff. It's like, I couldn't get it, I'll sleep even longer next time and I'll try again. And uh, you have, Things where some systems where you can you can pass in a function to say if you couldn't get that work f on that CAS loop, call this other function for a while so I can do something else and then try again and, and all these crazy things to try to avoid that contention. Make the best of your CPU. More anyone? Yes. Are there any other solutions for the ABA, ABA problem when uh, the company? The other solutions for ABA are. Um, the main problem with ABA is that you've taken your node and you popped it off your queue or other, you know, you can do lock-free lists and lock-free trees and all these other kind of things. And the main problem is you've taken this node out and you've given it back to the allocator. One of the solutions is don't give it back to the allocator, right? And, and if you have infinite memory, that's a great solution. Um, so what normally happens is you don't give it back to the allocator right now. And what happens is then you have to look at the bigger system of how is this lock-free container being used. And hopefully, in the usage of the lock-free container, there's, I think they call them uh, quiescent points, where you can say, I know no one's using this. By, by my programming logic of my use of this queue, I know no one's using the queue right now. So I tell the queue, do some cleanup. It's kind of like garbage collecting, right? It's like, you, you were holding these pointers off to the side so that you, you know, didn't reuse them. Now's a good time to clean yourself up. That's another way of d getting around ABA. Um, there's a whole thing called hazard pointers, which is a kind of a, uh, maybe a specific case of that, you know, putting pointers off to the side. Um, totally patented all over the place, I think, by IBM. Um, and there's, <laughs> there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of ways to do it, but... <laughs> That's the other thing, if you go on comp programming threads, some of the guys who wrote the patents will, are, are there. And some of them almost apologize for I worked at a place where I had to patent that, but um, yeah, there's, there's, for any one of these problems, there's like 10 solutions, all of them are complicated, and all of them have different trade-offs as to which one you want to pick for your particular use. So for, for speaking of having a lock-free library, as the lock-free library grows, we might have like tons of specializations of, well, here's, a, here's you know, we might have like eight lock-free queues, and it's like, why do we have eight, eight lock-free queues? It's like, because they're all different, you know, it depends what you're doing. Well, so it turns out the ones that are there are multi, multi, uh, multi producer, multi consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's except a except for the ring buffer, which right. I think is single producer. Single yeah. Producer. So that's that. You know, and and if you have one, that's a good compromise that says here's one that works in all situations. But if you know you only have often it's one producer, many consumers. Right. And now you've got a queue that's not as efficient as it could be. And why did you use it in the first place? Probably because you want it to be really efficient, right? So. Uh, in general, when we have an algorithm, we measure its complexity. It's say O n O log n, right? But in this case, you can't just say that. You can say it behaves like this when you have lots of writers and one reader. Yeah. It behaves like this when you have yeah. contention. It behaves better when you don't have contention, and so on, yeah. right? So there's it's a, a multi-dimensional space. There is a good. It's Dimitri's website. I forget what it's called. Um, good website out there. I mean, if you just start searching for lock free that he's categorized all the possibilities like okay you can have single producer or multiple producer single consumer multiple consumer and then there's like you know eight other eight other criteria of how you what you might want to what kind of characteristics you might want to have and then he starts describing here's the implementations of all these different you know and every time someone comes up with a new here's my my version of a lock free queue they're like well that's a this 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 and this lock free queue you know and you can look up whether that's been done before or this is a new thing and stuff like that. So his website is 1024cores.net. Yes, 1024cores.net. It's uh -huh. it's interesting. He's the guy who wrote Relacy as well that does Smile. does checking. <laughs> yeah, and he's got lots of blogs about. Uh, I mean, that's all he does is talk about lock free all day. So more questions? Yes. I wonder if you have a sense 
talk about which architectures are most suitable, or less suitable for load three. Um, interestingly, I, I would I wish that the load store load link load store conditional, which is on like PowerPC and some of the IBMs, I wish that was more prevalent and more exposed in the standard. And it's not very well exposed. It, it's exposed as compare exchange, which acts more like the x86 model. Um, but in general, uh, Intel doesn't do a lot of reordering on you. So a lot of a lot of atomic calls that you make, whether you say it's sequentially consistent or you say it's relaxed or you say it's load, acquire and store, a lot of those turn out to be the same thing on Intel because it wasn't doing a lot of crazy reorderings on you. But as you get into, as processors get more and more sophisticated, they're doing, they're relaxing their memory more and more and they're doing more crazy stuff on you. Um, so in general, uh, like even the Itanium and RISC processors and stuff like that, you can get more benefit from lock-free on those. But it's harder and harder to, you know, it shouldn't be harder to reason about because you should be using the same rules regardless. Your code should just work on all of them. But, um, I mean, the, the alpha processor reads a pointer and then reads the value in the pointer that, that, that was being pointed to and it reorders those. And you're like, you can't reorder that. How is that even possible to reorder that, right? You had to know what the pointer was pointing at before you, it's like, no, no, I reordered that on you. So I, still, I still don't, like I, I sit sometimes and try to figure out, well, well, how did you do that? But, you know, so there's benefits, good and bad to... Visibility, right? I mean, it's, it's a matter of what yeah. you can yeah. do from another thread. Yeah. Right? Basically, yeah. But when it comes down to the, when it comes down to like, what's the architecture doing behind that? It's like, oh, it's got cash, even cache lines and odd cache lines and like some caches are shared, some caches aren't shared and all this crazy stuff. And, it gets kind of scary. Okay, so I, I, I let's let's imagine that I purposely left time for questions. That's what I did. Yes. <laughs> Just a comment on the, the load link store conditional. It's actually very hard to expose that at the programming language level, I think, because many yeah. architectures have restrictions on what you can do between the load link and store conditional. Yeah, there's restrictions on what you can do between the load and the and the, the store conditional, and whether it's on the same cache line or not. You know, you end up having to do things. I, I had to dive into assembly once just to. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're called weak, weak low link and strong low link stuff. And so, yeah. you know, I think PowerPC probably has the strongest right. low link. So it's always, it's basically like locking that for a location. Yeah, if anyone touches it, you'll find out. Dave? I just, I, I heard what you said about your confusion about, about the way alpha behaves. The, the reason, again, why I hate thinking of things in terms of reordering. Yeah. Is that, cause I mean, if you don't if you don't think that there's any reordering in the world in the first place, or that doesn't become an issue, it, that doesn't bend your mind. You just said there's nothing guaranteeing that this thing is visible before that thing in the other thread. Right. I agree. Um, but let me say it so it gets on the thing on the tape. Um, basically, you know, I, I kind of show that what's going on under the hood is, is reordering. But it's probably better to not think about, hey, did my code get reordered, but instead think about, are the actions I'm doing on this thread visible by the other thread? And it becomes a, more of a visibility problem. And, and unless you're doing an atomic or a lock or some, you know, you, 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 on the unlock or whatever, the stuff you've done isn't necessarily visible on the other side. Some of it might be, some of it might not be, right? And, and there's no guarantee as, what, as to what is visible until you do some specific threaded lock or, or atomic operation. Some right? kind of synchronization primitive. Yes, some kind of synchronization primitive. And Dave's probably right that that's a possibly better way of thinking about all this stuff. Anyone? Yay, done? Yeah.